Oh, oh we're, maybe here's we're the thing, it. ladies and gentlemen. We are now live a little early. You're going to get a lot of pre-show. If you're one of the people that just wants to get right to the meat of the matter, I would suggest skipping ahead about 13 minutes to when we start the show. But Scott Johnson has very kindly provided this wonderful studio of his, and he, I kicked him out into the hallway because <laughs> we're trying to get rid of an echo. Yeah. So I, we started the live stream way early to see if we have squashed all the bugs. Okay. I think we fixed it. I can't. If it's there, it's quiet. And if you're not hearing it, it's fine. And if nobody else out there is hearing it, I may great. Have to do, I may have to do this show with the glasses. Oh, look at that. Wait, keep talking, uh, Scott. All right. Keep talking and the keep talking and don't blow up. It Hello? sounds good so yeah, far. Yeah, it sounds so. great. I have a feeling something, it was hearing something somewhere that maybe was taking it off sync, but with everyone with headsets on, everyone sounds great. I'm not hearing it anymore. Right. And I've started the uh, <coughs> Apple Geek Live stream concomitant. Lovely. With this one. Actually, since Roger put that headset on, I haven't heard it once. Oh. Okay. Hey, so Roger, put that headset on one more time. I think I may have figured it out. That's totally it. Oh. You know what it was? The little speaker arm, when he takes them off and sets them down, is close to the ear hole of his one of his right or left ear holes, oh. and it was picking it up out of your headset. It was the ear hole. Yeah, Don't it's be completely an ear hole. gone while you're wearing the headset. And then the minute you took it off, I could hear the little arm close enough to one How of the ear holes. How was he hearing it when he muted himself, though? Earlier, I d don't. I, mean, know. There I think he just. I think all he muted was just his speakers, not his headphones. Maybe. Yeah. Because it's gone now. I muted myself though. Yeah, I know. So there's got to be multiple sources. Maybe, but whatever he did just now to put that back on made it go away, and when he took it off, I heard it. Hmm. That's real weird. Maybe all right. it's the baby. <laughs> The baby. Yeah, anybody watching this video, I apologize for the. Um, it looks like I'm in some sort of interrogation room. This lighting in here is not not great. And yeah, make sure the icicle is turned up all the way too. Yeah, it's cranked. Am it's cranked. kind of quiet. Yeah, just lean and maybe get bring the high a little closer. It should be fine. You're not bad, just a little quiet. Okay, I've moved it to its fullest position. How's that? Oh yeah, much better. Okay, it's almost too here. I'm actually because I adjusted you in the hangout. I'm going to put you back now. Talk. All right, uh, here's me talking in the thing, doing the deal. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing. This is great. Keep wearing I that headset. You let me uh, sleep in your bed, in the <laughs> studio, drive your car. Well, I thought it was going to be too much when I asked you to wash my hair this morning. But... Yeah, gave me your dog. Yeah, it was fine. You guys, just know if Tom comes to town, there's certain expectations. <laughs> it's fine. So just so you know, I actually physically unplugged my headset from my computer, so All right. okay. it's just running straight well, on my desktop speakers. Okay. I'm going to steal your dog, Scott. She's awesome. She's steel worthy. I'm warning you right now. She, I'm buying an extra ticket on my flight back. I'm going to smuggle her on as my daughter. <laughs> Is this your daughter? Yeah. She's really strange looking. She looks like a dog, sir. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> Dare you? <laughs> uh, and Mike wants to know if I'm standing or sitting. Can you not tell? I can't tell either. Really? Are you st are you standing? Or are you sitting? I'm standing. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I I jump back and forth when I'm doing shows, so it's hard for me to say. Well, because I had the laptop over on the chair earlier, so I just kind of got used to standing. Oh, plus I guess I can't see the back. Yeah, I can't see the back of the chair anymore. So that's you're obviously not you're standing. How about them gawkers? Oh, gawker, dude. Gee, I wonder if we'll talk about gawker today. Oh, I bet we will. Oh, I can't get there from here. I ain't never been up here. Wouldn't recommend it. I'm gonna put this here to just fool people. I'll just be like. <laughs> this is a nice studio. I like it. You guys should see the rest of it. It's got servants, gold plating. 
I should figure out a way. I should figure out a way to make it less of a like here's Scott in the corner and make it so the more of the room is available for view. Now, I think about it. There are a few of out. This is directed towards only a very few people. Few people out there will watch live. <laughs> That's few people to begin with. Right. Then there are a few people who watch live and listen to AGR at the same time. Mm. You're going to have a hard time today because we're streaming AGR off of YouTube, which always introduces a delay. So don't freak out. Weird. I'm trying to think why they would do that normally. Why they would watch both? I don't yeah. know. There are people who do. They like it. Weird. Maybe they think that AGR audio is better or something. Maybe. It's pulling from the same source. Yeah. Well, it is in this case. See, and normally I have it pulling directly from my mixer. Mm -hmm. so it could be better or worse, depending. Now you look better at or worse? Let me look at this. Let me see how better. it works. That works. Okay. Yeah, that sounded, that sounded like a thing. I'm sure that... Where's your... Okay, I'm going to put the soundboard here. Make sure this... And that's a look at the top stories. Yeah! Yeehaw. Man, your monitor is so vast. <laughs> it is vast. It takes a while to get used to. I have to, like, I'm not going to get tired standing. I'm going to get tired walking to the end of the monitor <laughs> to find something. Uh, I'm, I'm going to steal your dog and your monitor. Oh, they've already got my interview up on uh, the web anyway. For Marketplace? Yeah. Oh, nice. Hey, uh, so you might know Jenny Josephson, who helps out producing this show, also produces for Marketplace. Uh, she got Scott Johnson to talk to Kai Rizdahl, and they got the interview up on the website. Which was super cool. hes I really like him. I was already a fan, so getting to talk to him was rad. Uh, whether people agree with my thoughts on the movie, I don't know. People are saying this is proof that you're taller than me, which is true. You are taller than me. <laughs> I am, but not like by a lot. Pull that. Well, I see is it because the Chewbacca is farther down on me. <laughs> well, and I also sit in the morning show because it's so long. Oh, so, I it's, see. so it's possible I'm a little higher because I'm sitting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like we adjusted the camera. It's not in the yeah. And the, and keep in mind that desk was made custom made specifically for my height. Yeah. So the any difference at all will kind of throw things off a little bit. All right. Well. I, don't, I almost feel like we should just start the show. Is that is that crazy? Is I'm that fine with whatever you want, man. See now here here's the problem. Here's your problem. I'm starting to get all the yos. All the yos? Yeah, people st still yo me. Oh, they're still yoing you. Yeah. Uh, here's one of the problems. When I do the soundboard on my iPad and the recording on the computer, I can press both of them at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to do the first part of the soundboard on your setup, I can't press both things at the same time. <laughs> That's true. First world problems, I know. <laughs> Still. You're not wrong. That's, that is definitely what you're looking at. Yeah. All right. You ready to go? Should we just I, go? I think I'm good. If you're ready, I'm ready, man. Let's do it. Here we go. Breaking news. Apparently, the hot new trend among the cool kids is to support the Daily Tech News Show. Don't you want to be one of the cool kids? Give in to peer pressure today by visiting dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 10th, 2016. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today from his own house, which I am in, Mr. Scott Johnson. Hey, man, what's going on over there 10, 20 feet to my right? <laughs> uh, thanks for letting me come in and rip apart your studio, sit in your seat to kick you out into the hallway so we didn't get an echo, uh, and do the show. This is kind of fun. I, I cannot think of anyone I would rather have come tear my studio up than Tom Merritt. Actually, we had, we, we had a, a myriad of weird little technical hoops to jump through, but I think we made it through all right. This is all right. We're working it through. If you're wondering why I'm in Salt Lake, uh, there is, of course, a Warcraft movie sh gathering of fans of Frog Pants happening tomorrow here in Salt Lake. Uh, Brian Ibbett's going to be here. I'm going to be here. That's going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, the news cooperated and gave us a E3 preview story with some interesting comments about, yes, Sony is going to have a new game console, but no, it won't do anything to people who own the PS4. They promise. <laughs> yeah, they say they promise, and I... I don't know what that means when they also, in some of the same breath, say things like, 
it will work with all, if not most, of the games that most come out. Of, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll yeah. talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Let's get into the top stories. So Gawker Media filed documents for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the Southern District of New York Friday. Gawker is appealing a $115 million award to Hulk Hogan in a privacy suit. And the judge in that suit denied a request by Gawker to delay payment to allow an appeal to progress. So Gawker's still appealing, but the judge says, you got to fork over the $115 million anyway. If you recall, uh, or if you've been following this, Hulk Hogan's uh, side of this case denied Gawker the ability to let insurance pay for that, so they have to pay it out of pocket, hence the bankruptcy. Ziff Davis's CEO, Vivek Shah, wrote a memo to employees saying, Ziff Davis has entered into an asset purchase agreement to acquire all of Gawker's properties free of the liabilities, subject to the outcome, of course, of the court-supervised action. And the media company will be auctioned off as a part of those bankruptcy proceedings. And it looks like Ziff Davis is trying to get to be first in line, Scott. Well, and very quickly today, uh, the one thing I was very interested in is to see what the individual satellite sites were saying about things. And uh, both Kotaku, Gizmodo, and probably others by now, have put up some form of statement saying, don't worry, we're here. Our parent company had to do this for these reasons. And then they very quickly throw under the bus the uh, Silicon Valley billionaire, co-founder of PayPal, uh, as the guy who's the reason for all of this happening. So it was a very um, pointed sort of, I guess, response from these various sites. And if you're wondering, uh, they are all, the io9 post was simply about, we'll still be posting, we'll still be here, we'll still be working. So they're not going to stop the sites, the sites are going to continue to operate. That's part of the Chapter 11 uh, bankruptcy proceeding, as far as I understand, is allowing you to continue to do your business while you uh, organize your assets for bankruptcy. Uh, it looks like this is also another part of the game of chicken here, where Gawker is going to say, you, you don't get anything because we're bankrupt. So yeah. they're not going to get anything out of this, possibly. We'll see if that works. Yeah, if they don't have the, I mean, if they literally just don't have the cash for a settlement like this, or for a judgment like this, then what are they to do? I mean, literally, this is the reason Chapter 11 exists. So them being able to continue to operate under those conditions, reorganize, may end up meaning at the end of this that they'll figure out a way to get that paid because legally they have to pay it. Right. But it may mean having to auction off these sites. They're probably going to be in a position where at least some of these holdings are going to have to go somewhere else because I don't know where else they're going to get the money. If they don't, if they don't have the money, reorganization usually means a lot of layoffs. That's what companies do. And if they're not going to cut some of the fat, whatever they consider to be fat, then that doesn't mean the money's going to appear out of nowhere. So everyone's glad today that there doesn't seem to be any immediate repercussions from this to the sites that they love. But that feels like just a matter of time. Well, that could be the, what ends, ends up happening is Ziff Davis or somebody else buys Gawker Media, the sites continue, they continue to make money. Uh, and they go on uh, in their merry way in their new home, whereas what's left of Gawker Media will be the debt. Uh, oh. Ziff Davis has said they would buy it free of the liabilities, in which case the, the Hulk Hogan side is merely going after a shell corporation that only owns debt and has no way of repaying the money. If, here's the only question I would, I would ask about this that I, I, I really can't even guess at. If they figure out a way out of it, the reorganization allows them to maybe sell off one or two of the blogs to, to sites uh, that, that take them and bring them enough money to make sense of all this. And let's say Gawker at the end of all this is left standing and is still an operating .com, like the actual Gawker, not the, not the overall holding company, but the actual Gawker website that tends to break these news bits that get them in trouble. Do you think that this will have the chilling effect that some may suspect and, and suddenly Gawker no longer uh, is dabbling in the in that kind of news coverage. Yeah, I, well, first of all, it's almost a moot point because if Ziff Davis takes over, Gawker's not going to do that sort of thing but, uh, anymore. Nick Denton has has bent over backwards to say, we don't really do that kind of thing anymore anyway. We're, we're focusing on more long-form uh, reporting. So yeah, I, I, I don't know how much of a chilling effect you'll be able to prove on Gawker, but it certainly is going to make a lot of other organizations that might want to dip into the tabloid side of things, think twice about going after anything, at least anything remotely related to Peter Thiel. Yeah, watch your back, uh, TMZ. That's all we're saying. Mm. Uh, some of the 32 million Twitter accounts claimed to be uh, for sale on the black market appear to be legitimate. All right, so there's that. And Twitter has looked, uh, or excuse me, locked some accounts requiring legitimate users to reset passwords. 
Twitter's chief security officer, Michael Coates, wrote in a blog post that the credentials may have been combined from recent breaches at other sites and malware on victims' machines. So this uh, these these Twitter this Twitter account story not over yet. Yeah, and and this confirms that at least some of the accounts, as we heard yesterday, are valid. Uh, there's still speculation that all 32 million probably couldn't be all valid. Uh, and Twitter would have the resources to check all of those. And, and pretty much what they're saying is we've shut down some accounts. So I think that that makes it clear that, yeah, there were there were some real accounts in here. Twitter is taking action to secure those accounts. Uh, and the rest of them are probably bogus. It feels like, uh, I don't know, when it rains, it pours with the hacker stuff. Like there's always a bunch of these bundled up at, at one time. So there's always like LinkedIn and then this yeah. other thing in MySpace. And there certainly have been a bunch of high profile ones. But I also feel like when it rains, it pours uh, also because you notice. Like yeah. wrinkles once every three months, you don't notice it. But it's like learning, learning a new word. When you learn a new word, you suddenly see it everywhere. It's not that it's being used more. So I think when there is a big hack like LinkedIn, suddenly a lot of smaller hacks get reported more than, or at least noticed more than they would otherwise. When someone buys a minivan, everyone has a minivan. Bloomberg reports Apple will buy a minivan. No. Uh, Bloomberg reports <laughs> Apple will use Intel modem chips in some versions of the next iPhone instead of modem chips from Qualcomm. We're talking about the baseband here, not the CPU. Apple's going to continue to design its own ARM architecture. But the baseband modem chip will be made by Intel for AT&T models as well as some overseas models. Verizon models and iPhone iPhones sold in China will continue to use Qualcomm modems. So they're diversifying their supply chain here. And uh, Bloomberg points out, if you remember, Infineon provided the modem chip for the first iPhone back in 2007, and then Apple switched to Qualcomm after Intel acquired Infineon. So this is Intel getting their Infineon DNA back in the game. That seems fine. I mean, I, I don't know that there's, um, like everything I've seen on the coverage of this uh, move doesn't seem to report that either is a bad solution. It just sounds like a, a them shifting around the supply chain a little bit and yeah. uh, the end users aren't going to notice the difference. It's good news for Intel who wants to get more mobile chips uh, business. It's probably good news. It's probably neither good news nor bad news for Apple. I suppose it's good news in the in the sense of they've got a more diverse supply chain so they're not dependent on one company's whims. Uh, it's not great news for Qualcomm, but it's not horrible because a lot of rumors were saying they were going to lose all of the business in baseband chips, and they are keeping more of it than people expected. Well, Facebook launched video comments on Friday. That's today, worldwide. What does that mean? Well, it's a feature that is developed by the Facebook 50th Hackathon. Users can now upload video into comments and replies to posts that people have on their, on their walls, on their pages. Uh, whatever those posts may be, as long as they've allowed uh, commenting there, and within groups and events. Uh, the feature is supported on the web, iOS, and Android. So now, finally, you can react in ways that aren't just simply a like or a dislike, or not dislike, but all their new little emoticon things that they've added. But you can actually poke in there with a little video and say, that's great, I'll see you at the thing, or you're the worst, and I hate your guts. And I don't know how much of this is going to get moderated outside of the user who started the post, but... Uh, I, I'm, I'm with the, with the user base as big as Facebook's. I'm a tiny, tiny bit nervous about how this gets used in the first 24. Yeah, it's no different than the moderation necessary for text posts. I, I, I mean, granted, uh, if you have somebody who gives naughty texts, a naughty video might be a little more shocking. Uh, but it's still you still got moderation involved in being able to restrict who can see and comment and all of that. I I get old man about this. I'm like. Ah. I don't want to have to play video to see what you said <laughs> in my reply. That's just, uh, I, sometimes I'm in a situation, you know, where I'm with a, a bunch of other strangers on a train or in an airport. I don't want to play video out loud. I don't want to have to grab my headphones. Rah, stop mm. making video comments, you kids. It does seem, it does seem like that's going to be a bit of a pain for thing. Like I, I'm trying to think if I put a post on my, on my wall and I say whatever I say, and then I get a bunch of replies via video is it going to show me how long those comments are? Like if it's a six, seven, six or seven second reply, I think I'll probably play it. If I see three minutes of video, I'm not going near that thing. Well, and, and then also I imagine we probably won't see too many people doing this because it's just as much of a pain to record a video too. 
-hmm. when you're like, oh, I'm not in a situation where I can actually, you know, have good lighting and say things out loud. I don't know. It, it, it is probably funny because always counts. Probably you're really, and you're talking about the, the medium here because you and I will get on Facebook or on, uh, excuse me, on Snapchat and we'll do a video story. Hey, here we are at lunch and we're doing this thing and here's this funny deal or whatever. And that's the medium people expect. They go in knowing they're going to get a multi-second thing and they're going to watch it. That's, that's the whole buy-in. This is like saying, all right, well, here's a book to read and every so many pages you get to watch a movie. It's just, a, it's a little bit weird, a little yeah. bit strange. Apple has formed a subsidiary called Apple Energy LLC to sell excess solar energy it generates for its data centers, stores, and corporate offices. They're trying to get as close to 100% renewable energy sources as they can. The company has announced plans for 521 megawatts of solar projects globally. Solar farms are located mostly in Cupertino, California, and Nevada. Intriguingly, Apple has filed for permission to sell at market rates which means they wouldn't just resell energy to other power companies. That would be a fairly normal thing to do because if you have excess solar during the day, you would sell it to the power companies to get credit to pay for maybe natural gas or, or, or some other kind of clean energy for the nighttime needs of the data centers. When you're talking about selling at market rates, that means selling to homeowners or, as 9to5Mac points out, it could also be used to provide energy at charging stations for electric cars. Ooh, if you're fueling, uh, fueling, <laughs> that's a good word to use. If you're fueling rumors about Apple getting into the uh, the electric car business, I think that's probably a fair thing to say. But in the short term, Tom, it seems like maybe, just maybe, if you live in a jurisdiction where it's available, I could buy some power from Apple? How would that work? Yeah, exactly. That's why the car charging station just sounds more practical to me. I don't know that Apple has a continuous enough amount of excess energy to say, well, we can, we can, we, we can give this one neighborhood energy or something like that. They'd, and that becomes a lot more complicated. If they're saying, we're going to set up charging stations, those charging stations will have batteries. So the, solar, the excess solar energy goes in to the batteries and then the battery power is sold to the consumer. That could make a lot of sense to me. It feels a little early for that sort of thing to be realistic, but maybe they apply for this market rate approval just so they have it whenever they eventually might need to do it yeah and call me sentimental but i i say good job to them for doing something that's also seems responsible as a company um there are a lot of things apple probably could do to improve the way it does its business but the idea that they could take excess energy that otherwise would be going nowhere and and doing something with it that is either productive or otherwise not wasteful that seems like a good move so i'm happy <laughs> to hear that. in the chat room said the thinnest energy yet. <laughs> None of love it. Until next year. You'll get thinner energy next year. Uh, first generation Chromebooks. I hate to tell you guys this. You're officially reached your end of life. According to Google's ELL policy, that's end of life policy, after five years, Chromebooks no good anymore. Uh, Chrome devices are considered obsolete and automatic software updates, this includes security updates from Google, are no longer guaranteed. The original CR48 and Samsung's Chromebook 5 have already reached EOL, and uh, the Acer AC700 comes up in August as being end of life. Uh, kind of glad I didn't buy a Chromebook in the earliest of days because it uh, even at the time you felt like, well, this seems cool and also new, and that means experimental, and that means we're going to iterate real quick on this. So if you were a little bummed that you bought in early, you're going to have to probably go out and get a new one. Yeah, in five years, uh, you know, for someone who goes through tech like we do, probably seems sufficient. But for a lot of people, they keep their laptops for five to ten years, mm -hmm. especially something lightweight by the like the Chromebook, which, sure, okay, the early adopters are the ones being impacted right now. There's some confusion about whether Google really will cut them off. It's just not guaranteed, but maybe they'll put out some more security updates. Uh, we'll see how badly they treat uh, these older owners. But what about for someone buying a Chromebook now who's like, really, I, I need to keep this for probably six or seven years, to be to be frank. I know well, a lot of people like that. Computers and notebooks have definitely uh, entered that space of I'm holding on to this for longer, or at the very least, I'm passing this down to somebody else. So we're still only really buying one new notebook and somebody else is getting it. That's how we do things around the house. My daughter gets my old MacBook. I move up to something else. Right. So the idea that every two, three years you're going to be upgrading may be true for some on the edge, you know, tech enthusiasts, but I don't think so for the, for the general public or the business public, which is primarily the sort of the, the traveling business folk that they're aiming these, these devices at. So 
as much as I'm excited about the new features of Chrome OS and its ability to run native Android apps and all that kind of stuff is real cool. Um, a little sad when stuff goes end of life. Also, it also just kind of harkens to this thing with Google, which is kind of sometimes a problem where you don't know what they're going to do with a, with a product you like. Yeah. You, if they, you may love it and they're sort of half on it. And then you suddenly find out they sold it or they folded it, or there's an announcement that newsreader's gone or whatever. And they have a, they have a history of that. So I, I feel like that's hard to shake and until they until they have a nice long time where they've shown a real dedication to a platform it's hard for me to want to get too excited about that yeah i mean honestly as long as the operating system will still work you should still get the updates yep. right the operating yep. system continues to to be developed so in an interview with the financial times sony interactive entertainment president and group ceo andrew house confirmed the existence of a new SKU of the PS4, a SKU just means a model number, so there will be a new model PS4, codenamed Neo, uh, that will support ultra-high-def 4K video. But he stated it will not be shown at this year's E3. House also confirmed that all games would support the standard PS4 by default. So you're not going to get a game that won't work on the PS4 that you own or could buy today. And he said... We will be selling both versions through the life cycle, though the new 4K version will be more expensive. Uh, so, so that the little tweak that you mentioned earlier, Scott, is the idea that like, hey, all the games will play on the PS4. If you buy the new one, maybe they'll play on that one too. Yeah, one of the weirder quotes was, "This device is designed to set right alongside your existing PS4," which makes zero sense to say. It is a PS4 in every way, plus 4K video, plus beefed up GPU and possibly RAM. They haven't gone into big, big detail on that, but clearly performance specs have been bumped, however little or however much. Uh, so to say that is disingenuous and weird. I don't know why they would say that. Uh, PS4 owners aren't going to want to run out and buy a $450 device to put next to their existing PS4 that is essentially another PS4. It makes no sense. We're going to talk so, about this a little more in advance of E3 and compared to the rumors, the unconfirmed rumors we have about the Xbox. Uh, but that's the top stories for today. Thanks to everybody who submits stuff on our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Drew CPU's in there, Loki Robert, PC Guy 8088, SP Sheridan, Steve IO, and and more. You guys are the best. Get in there and join them, folks. Either submit stories or vote on the ones that are submitted. Let us know what you'd like us to talk about at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. And that is a look at the top stories. All right. So I, I, I know I kind of I kind of cut you off there. So. No, dude. I'm so excited about this. I was going too fast. But <laughs> here's the here's the quote that you're talking about. All games will support yeah. the standard PS4. So there you go. You got a PS4 today. All the games are going to support it. And we anticipate all or a very large majority of games will also support the high-end PS4. There's minimal developer work to support both. Uh, and yeah, it is intended to sit alongside. To sit alongside? It, those are the words he used. And complement the standard PS4. So I wonder, is this like, hey, if you get a new 4K TV, this is the PS4 you should buy for that 4K TV. Keep your old PS4 because they can work together somehow. It's nonsense, in my opinion, this, this language. Um, I don't know what prompted this other than there's been a lot of pressure since that leak, what, a couple of months ago, which turned out to be true, a lot of pressure on Sony to answer for it, and they've been very quiet about it. Now they've said, well, we're not showing it anything at E3. That already opens up a giant can of questions as to why not. Um, and what, why not is probably because it got leaked and they weren't ready to talk about it yet, which I understand. The company's not ready to show it. That, I also think, is fine. But why right the weekend before E3, are they suddenly having a statement about it? And the only answer I have in my head is Microsoft, also rumors with Project Scorpio, uh, supposed to be four times as powerful as the current Xbox One. A a again, kind of a, a, a all rumors up to this point not confirmed, but something to answer the Neo rumors. They must know that probably true and that the entire console business is moving more toward a PC type environment of upgrade cycles. And so they felt like they had to say something. My only problem is the way he said it is terrible. To say that they sit next to each other and they compliment each other makes no sense when you're also telling me they both play all the games each other plays with the caveat that maybe not quite all, but most. Like, it's a really weird statement. It feels unprepared and rushed to me. Yeah, and here's, here's what he said about not having it at E3. We want to ensure we have a full range of the best experiences on the new system that we can showcase in their entirety. So... That makes me think, 
he he doesn't have developers on board yet, or at least not far enough along that he can show anything. That makes sense. You don't want to show something off at E3 that's not ready. So why talk to the Financial Times about it? Like, why leak this out in front of E3? Is it... There, I got two conspiracy theories, Scott. Okay. One is that you just want to diffuse the fan anger, right? You get everybody angry today, so by the time the Sony press conference rolls around next week, they just don't have the gumption to keep being angry about it. The other is that if I have my schedule right, the Sony announcement happens after the Microsoft announcement. Microsoft is at 9.30 a.m. Pacific on Monday. Sony is at 6 p.m. Pacific on Monday. Are they trolling Microsoft? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, this wouldn't be the first time that they uh, scooped them a little bit. I don't know, though. Like, does this put Microsoft in a position where they have to answer the Project Scorpio question? And are they trying to force them to do it at E3 where they'll be able prepared to do that? Um, you know, there's a, there's a good comparison going around today that at that conference in 2013, uh, uh, or was it 2012 when they made the? I guess it was 2013 when they announced the price. Uh, they they basically Microsoft showed up uh, dressed for a rugby game and found out they were playing soccer. It's kind of like that. They're just not prepared for what Sony's about to pull out of their hat. And maybe Sony's doing that again. I think it's a fair conspiracy theory among conspiracy theories. However, um, I think that this is a way for them. And I think, again, poorly done. The language of this is bad. It's contradictory and weird. N nobody vetted this. I don't know why they didn't. It's just bad. But outside of that, this is part of the entire console business making a shift. And that shift is to, hey, mid-cycle, how about another version? How about an upgrade path? How about better performance? How about what PCs have done since the beginning? And I, and I was telling you this morning, I know PC owners like myself who don't think twice about the idea that NVIDIA has a new video card. None of us complain and stomp around and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe the 1080 is coming out this year. We know, we understand the cycle with PCs and PC gaming. When it comes to consoles, those self-same people, me included, we get a little irritated at the idea that somebody's going to be able to go out and buy a brand new console that's better than the one you've already invested in, yet somehow they're all playing the same games. Well, then what's the point? Like, there's all these questions. It's all about expectations, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I bought the PS4 expecting that it would last me for five to ten years, and you're yeah. telling me three years in, you're going to give me a new one? That's mm -hmm. not what I expected. I don't get mad at NVIDIA because I expect them to come out with a new one every year. I don't get mad at the iPhone because I expect them to come out with a new one every year. Yeah, the, the the cycles that we're getting used to with with portable devices and so on. Like you mentioned, phones, phones, phones are now in that place where we just have that expectation. It was that way from the get go or close to it. This has never been like this. It's always been eight to ten years. It was what it was, and I don't blame them for making the shift. I think it's a good shift, but they've got to be real careful and I think very forward facing on it. And so far, they haven't been. It's all been leaks, rumors, and then what feels like scrap together responses to those leaks well and to be fair the leaks and rumors aren't their fault they didn't want them to be leaked that's true uh, until true. now right this is the right. first time that we've seen sony go oh yeah we've got a skew and and the only thing that makes sense for them to do that to me is that okay what are the xbox rumors that there's project scorpio uh one rumor says it's four times more powerful than the xbox capable of six teraflops of processing power can support vr in the 4k etc there's also the xbox slim that supposedly might come out in August with a redesigned controller. There's a streaming stick. I, I don't think the streaming stick causes any problem. Nobody sees that as a, an un undermining of the Xbox One. The Xbox Slim, eh, there's been a PlayStation Slim before. Though, though That kind of thing might be all right. But Project Scorpio. So if Sony is trying to make Xbox feel comfortable giving details about Project Scorpio and, and stoking the fires of anger, and then Sony comes out well, at 6 p.m. on Monday, and says, oh, when we mention that SKU, yeah, what it's going to be is an add-on to your existing PS4 <laughs> that allows you to play 4K games. And, of course, there'll be a new SKU because if you don't already have a PS4, you can buy a bundle that will include that 4K add-on and provide that functionality. But essentially, if you have a PS4 today, it will continue to play all the games, and if you get a 4K TV, you just buy this add-on, and it adds 4K functionality, and essentially like is, is an external video card, is what I'm thinking. They could do that. There's been a lot of talk lately about external GPU and their right. advantages, um, so that wouldn't be too crazy or out of left field, but um, they he does have... It, it almost needs to be that. Like, what you just said needs to be the announcement at E3. Otherwise, he's lying here by saying they're not going to show this thing at E3. And so if it's a full console, 
they they get accused of some pretty sneaky tactics by doing that because they do have an advantage i think of going after microsoft every year it used to be thought of as an advantage to be before but it's not so true anymore and i think sony changed that narrative so that because we've got that same schedule and they can kind of size up what microsoft does ahead of time and make a lot of changes between morning and evening um i you know bob's your uncle i have no idea what they're going to show but if they show anything at all they're going, even if it's just an add-on, they're going to be accused of some pretty sneaky tactics. Well, they're, they're not going to display anything. They're not going to show anything. They could announce. Yeah, they could. Hey, that's whatever true. they want. Yeah, that's true. They could. And I, and honestly, as a gamer and as somebody who covers this, I would, I would prefer that they would say something. And I would also like Microsoft to at least address the idea yeah, of whether Scorpio is something or not. Yeah. yeah. Right because that. if you want to start getting us as the player base used to an upgrade path in the console world, which has never happened before, you got to start now. Well, if you're interested in what's going to be happening at E3, uh, of course, there's streams of those press conferences all over the place. Uh, but you guys, uh, yourself and Patrick Beja, are going to be doing a live coverage of all the press announcements. Is it going to be at frogpants.com slash live? Uh, that is correct. We'll have it on frogpants.com slash live or frogpants.com slash twitch. Either one will get you to the Twitch stream, which will either embed uh, on the site or you can go to the Twitch and do it. We'll have two live chat rooms. Uh, we did this very self-same thing last year. We'll have video of Patrick and I having commentary. We'll also wear legally available video of the actual conferences so we can do commentary on them. Most of them last year, they were okay for rebroadcast, so we were so that's what we did. And we'll also put it up on audio podcast uh, forum for both the Boop Show, which is the show I host, and Patrick's Pixels show. And after all of it's done, he and I will spend some time together doing a big wrap-up uh, and to kind of do what we did last year. It worked out really well. And DTNS, of course, we get a ton of coverage from uh, from E3 this year. I'm really looking forward to next week. It's going to yeah, be great. Yeah, uh, if you're wondering about Apple's WWDC, uh, I'll be covering that using the public uh, live app. So look for that at dailytechnewsshow.com, just doing live commentary. We'll get some other people in there too, hopefully. And then uh, that way you don't have to, you could still have the stream up for E3 stuff and then watch along, or you could stream the actual Apple thing itself from Apple and, and read the commentary as it goes along. And then we'll have coverage of that, Justin Robert Young and I, on Monday. And then, of course, Tuesday, uh, Patrick Beja will be on the show with Paul Spain, uh, who's attending E3, and we'll talk about E3 then. Uh, and then Scott will be back on the show next Wednesday. So it's all, it's going to be a hoopla of a week next yeah. week. Yeah, whatever these two chuckleheads show at their conferences, I guarantee we'll have lots of talk about it. And even more than that, I can't wait to talk about whether or not E3 shows its age this year and starts to look like a thing that may not exist in our future very long. Because I, I have some real concerns about the future of E3. Our pick of the day comes from Steve in the OC, uh, the Android app agent. When you're driving, it will read your text messages to you so that you know if you need to pull over to deal with a text message emergency. It also auto-replies that you're driving and, and tells people you will get back to them later. You can find it on the Google Play Store. Again, it's called Agent, A-G-E-N-T. It's got four stars, uh, tens of thousands of reviews, so it seems like it's a pretty solid app, and Steve in the OC recommends it as well. Nice. Send your picks to us, folks. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. You can find more picks at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash picks. Got a bunch of messages here. Uh, Sam in Much Cooler, Oregon says, I enjoyed your conversation with Lamar about talking on the phone while driving. My idea that came to mind was why not put some research into how people talking on the phone while driving could be made safer if people are just going to continue to do it. I'm a pilot, and I had to learn how to talk on the radio and fly at the same time. At first, it was overwhelming, but you learn over time what phases of flight work better for talking on the radio. Truckers talk on their CVs a lot, and they have better safety record than the general public because they're trained. Uh, so I, I can see a lot of people reacting badly to this, Sam, and saying, like, that's a horrible idea. You're just encouraging people to still talk. But what if it was not only just training people how to talk on the phone while driving, but also an app that changed the conversation to be more like what a pilot has with a radio tower where you're not talking at all at the same time and imagining what the other person is saying, but it's more of a walkie-talkie situation because I think that's one of the things that makes CB conversations easier to carry on is that it's one at a time. Sure. You, know, you don't have yeah, to give all your attention to the conversation. In the early, um, the early App Store days, I don't know if you remember, and I don't remember the name of the app. It was an app that actually uh, Eileen and I were using quite a bit when we were doing App Slappy together. But it was this this app that worked like a CB, and you would, you know, hold a button, quickly say a message, put it down, and they would get these very short replies. And you were, it worked back and forth, kind of like a walkie-talkie. 
Um, that always seemed very convenient and quick and, and, and stuff. And I know that like iOS has the, now has built in quick voice memos that I don't think work very well. They're okay, but sometimes they disappear for no reason. Like there's some weird stuff with that, but getting back to stuff like that would be okay. We now have voice activation in a way that should make that even less of a hands on type uh, experience. But at the same time, part of me is also like, yeah, but we ought to probably also figure out ways not to to do this stuff anymore. I mean, like, I, I shouldn't record podcasts in my car anymore. That's the thing I should. <laughs> there, there's the, the idea that you should shut up and drive. Right. And I'm not, I, I, I do not, I personally do not quibble with that. You should, but there's also dealing with the reality of like, well, you can say that until you're blue in the face, you can pass laws. And if people still don't do it, if it still doesn't have the effect, socially speaking, what else can you also do? Uh, I think it's intriguing that maybe we could do studies to find out, like, if you do a more of a walkie-talkie conversation, does that somehow change the situation? Does that make you safer? Maybe it doesn't. I'd like to see that study, though. Well, there's be, there'd be, I mean, obviously, the study you guys talked about the other day was a really eye-opening study. It was something I had assumed, which was hands-free meant you were safer, and as it turns out, you're really not. So, you know, if we can, I have no problem with experimenting with this stuff. I don't know if I want to be the guy on the road that does the experimentation, but at the end of the day, just... Shut up and drive, but if we have to, maybe there's some other solutions. I don't know. I'm with you. There's there's a middle ground somewhere. Patrick Beja and I were talking about standardizing 911 just sort of off the cuff uh, across the world, and Kevin would be very happy about that. He was born in Hong Kong, and, or he and his wife uh, were born in Hong Kong and Singapore where it's 999. It's 000 in Australia. Uh, he's designed and deployed several link Skype for business systems for clients, and in all of these implementations, they made a point to ensure that most of the common emergency numbers are included and translated to whatever the local number is for that country. So in a multinational company with offices in Australia, Singapore, and the United States, they make sure that calls made from the U.S. office to 000999 or 112 all get translated to 911 and vice versa in other offices. This ensures that when employees travel, they don't have to worry about what number to call, and the first number that pops in their head will work. But gosh, wouldn't it be easier if there was just one number everywhere? I completely agree. Like standardize this the way we standardize clocks and the way we standardize uh, time zones or whatever it is. The, all the things that the world agrees on, it's Wednesday today and we all say it's Wednesday. I am all for that sort of thing. So, say it's Thursday. Well, they do, but that's just because they're ahead of us a little bit. But, you know, an hour is an hour. A minute's a minute. A second is a second. Why? Because that in, in, in big human ways, we right. all and need to be on the same page. Meter and everyone in the world agrees that, um, that we use meters to measure. <laughs> all right. There are a few exceptions, and I, but I actually think we should all move to, to <laughs> Celsius and meters and everything. But, however, uh, this seems like because we're talking about the public safety, wherever that public may be, standardization would just solve a lot of problems. Now, yesterday, uh, Tinder decided to solve the problem of teens on Tinder by not letting them use Tinder anymore, at least if you're under 18. Uh, redacted from Humid Memphis, Tennessee, wrote in regards to Thursday's Tinder discussion, I feel that the removal of 13 to 17-year-olds is going to annoy other users. There's already a plethora of teenagers using fake birthdays to meet older people, and that gets tiresome. My profile is set to discover 21 to 28-year-old women, and I do not want to feel like a creep seeing the dating profile of a teenager who had to fake her age so she could use the service. Ugh. The whole thing freaks me out, uh, like single stuff generally. And I, well, the and reason... Southern Single did not put their <laughs> actual name here. Yeah. Uh, but, it, it, you know, I, I'm happy to let this person speak that frustration because I, I have no direct experience with Tinder. Well, the, the, he's, you know, Southern Single says here that there's already a plethora of teenagers using fake birthdays to meet other people, and that gets tiresome. Like, honestly, there are people out there just looking for a date, looking for relationships, and there's no reason why the Internet can't provide that. But if it's like any other spam on any other page, any other bots that are filling up a Twitter feed and your followers are fake or whatever, it is tiresome. It's lame. And it's got nothing to do with the creep factor as much as it does, you know, can we not have nice things? Like, let's just quit having a bunch of fake accounts, please. Yeah. Uh, finally, a couple of pilots wrote in about self-driving cars and flying cars and, and autopilot. Uh, and Harry thinks the reason we don't have flying cars is Moore's law in aviation. He says, you have to ask yourself why Paul Moeller spent 50 years and $100 million trying to do this with nothing to show for it. And the answer is not throwing money at it. You can't change the laws of physics. 
The sad truth is, if all these various designs that people are working on were to actually come to fruition, you'd really only have an aircraft you could fly from an airport and then drive home. Taking off vertically to escape a traffic jam on the freeway will never happen, says Harry. Lastly, automated or not, would you really want thousands of these devices buzzing around at low altitude over your house? Again, because of the laws of physics, they're probably always going to be noisy. For what it's worth, I think we will get driverless cars before we get a practical flying car, as most people envision. I agree with Harry. Absolutely. I, and I, I, I'd never really considered the idea of being in a traffic jam and your decision to just <laughs> vertically take off and get out of there was a solution. Yeah, would be doing it, and then there'd just be a traffic jam. Yeah, when, it would be utter chaos. You'd never have real traffic jams because everybody would see one coming and just get the hell out of there. I, I think that there is a possibility that the laws of physics can bend or we can find ways around certain laws of physics, but I fully respect Harry's point that it's, you know, they, they got as far as they could get with advances in aircraft at a certain point 50 years ago, and it's really slow going now. So it's, it's not, it, it, it's easier said than done to say, ah, oh, we'll finally get a big advance now. Uh, and then Joe, the pilot, uh, said, heard us talking on, on TMS, on the morning stream, about Uberfly, <laughs> that, that <laughs> with the idea of Uber getting into flying cars and then uh, doing self-flying cars. He says, Scott, I love you like an old man Johnson neighbor screaming at the kids to get inside and play Overwatch instead of hitting baseballs in the park. I'm a proud <laughs> frog panther. But people, don't forget that an airplane is an autonomous vehicle. Many of them believe it, but the autopilot while it can do some amazing things these days, and future ones may replace me as a pilot, and then I'll become a professional podcaster with a show called The Morning Dump. <laughs> but it's cruise control in airplanes right now more than anything else. I love computers, but they give up when the going gets tough. I don't take manual control in some uncommon situations. The computer gives up and hands it back to me. Anyway, you may already know this. I think that your point was probably more don't fear the computers, kids. Hollywood makes stuff up. But just in case, I'm working hard up there with the other pilot, and that's with or without the autopilot on. Yeah, he's not wrong. And I didn't want to, I, d I hope I didn't diminish the, uh, the impact of having these live, trained, professional human beings up there. I would much prefer them to be up there. My whole point was that we're terrified of more automation in our cars yet we're not afraid of the deaths we're having every day at the hands of people behind wheels. And we already have pretty good data that shows in testing that we will significantly reduce those accidents and those deaths every year by moving to something more automated. The airplane one is kind of a good example and kind of not a good example. There's a lot of automation now, but he's right. When things go weird, it's not like he has to go, give me the plane back, computer. It goes the other way. It revolts and it's like, yeah. oh. I'm flying better than you, Joe. Yeah, which is an important point. So, yeah, he, a point well made, I would say there, Joe, the pilot. And I hope I'm in one of your planes one day. Uh, me too. Uh, thank you, Scott Johnson, for letting me steal your studio. It's not a problem. Uh, I expect a full uh, and complete uh, cleaning when you're no, it's fine. You're, it, my, listen, my space is your space. My space passwords are not hacked, but my space is your space. Friendster is not. I got right. it. <laughs> uh, no, this has really been fun. Of course, uh, as we mentioned, check out frogpants.com slash live uh, or frogpants.com slash twitch next week for the E3 coverage. Uh, thanks to everybody who is a patron of the show. We do this show entirely based on how much you like it and are willing to back it. If you're willing to give us a dollar or more a month, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support or patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 593-2459. Catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. And visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. Back with coverage at WWDC on Monday with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Doom. Yay. Totally it worked. worked. Yeah. Seems to have. Yeah. Yeah, that went well. It was good. Thanks, man. Well, I like that last comment about uh, viewer comment about molar. It's true. You can't oh, yeah. define, you can't defy the laws of physics. And you know what? Everything he's trying has been tried by the U.S. Air Force back in the '60s. There's a reason why they didn't go forward with it. They even built a flight that I don't remember. They they built the uh, the Avro car, 
is basically like a hovering UFO that the Air Force dumped a boatload of money because it's going to be like a flying car. At the end of it, it's like, you know what, we wasted a lot of money. Let's just say no to this and put it in storage somewhere and never talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, when, when Tom read that, I wanted to do Scotty's voice so bad. You cannot change the laws of physics. <laughs> Except in Star Trek, you can because in a couple of episodes, oh, they definitely Mr. Spock, do. Mr. Spock said, "Perhaps you know whatever you know they come from our the our, our physical laws do not apply," yep. which is basically his way of saying magic. <laughs> yep, we can fly around the sun backwards in a bird of prey, and time will go back. Yeah, why don't yep. we just do that for everything? <laughs> yep. It's as bad as Superman 1, saving Lois. It's the worst. It's yeah. the worst time to travel mechanism. I can't stand it. Um, it preys upon the stupidity of people. That's why I don't like it. That's most movies, though. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Hey, you, how do you I finalize this? Uh... Oh, here, I'll come. Let me come in there. Hey, what do we got for titles? Roger? So, titles. The top one is Facebook, colon, You're the Worst, iPower, Non-user serviceable power um, in the Utah PSK4 or PS4K. New SKU review coming right at you. You know, for for a take on the new zoo review, children's show from the 70s. Gawk Hacker. Video Speaks a Thousand Comments. World of Newscraft. World of Newscraft. Uh, not, and not a tear was shed for Gawker. And not a tear was shed for Gawker. There seem to be a lot of... Uh, Facebook. Sony, Sony, com, Sony video game comments. thought there'd be more. P.S. Yeah. More? I kind of like that. Yes. Tom, you've changed into a woman. Well, hi. Oh, hey. What's up, Jenny Josephson? Well, I have breaking news to announce. What? What is it? What is Scott's it? Scott's not even here for this announcement. He is. He's right next to me. I don't well, know. Get it? Get in there. Uh, Are you standing next to someone? All right. I can't see you right now either. Oh well. No, can, uh, can you hear me though? I can hear you. I can see you. All right. So here's the only thing you need to know is that Scott Johnson of the Instance and the Frog Pants Network and the DTNS is going to be on Marketplace like in 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Like the actual live Marketplace? Little clip of the interview on the actual live Marketplace. And then if you go to the link I sent and you guys can put it in chat, there's a seven-minute interview with Scott Johnson and Kai Rizdahl on the web all about Warcraft. Is that Marketplace so, not? Org. Org. Right. So, convergence complete. Nice. Nice. Happy Warcraft weekend. Yay. So That's fantastic. We wish you were here. Tune in. I tune in the Marketplace right now if you're watching live. Turn in. If it's live where you are uh, at any point, turn in and listen. But more importantly, guys, go to that page and leave comments and show your force because this is like, this is proof of concept here. Nice. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so let him know you do, love it. Scott can do public. You know, you will love it. Yes. I put it in Slack. You can tell every single person that's going to that movie to go to that page and look at it because uh, you, Scott did a great, great job in the interview. Not that it should be any surprise, uh, but it was super awesome. It was super informative. And, uh, you know, show your power, Tadpool, the Chat Realm, between Diamond Nerd Club. And Nerd Marketplace. It didn't seem like a total shut-in, right? No, it was awesome. Right. It really was like a great moment where I actually knew legitimately the best person to talk to about this topic. <laughs> well, that's too kind. I think it worked out pretty good. It worked out great. It was like my day. Anyway, I just wanted to pop in and let you guys know that I've now officially Venn diagrammed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> And I'm going to try to sneak out early and get on the analyst call. Cool. Right. Awesome. Well, we'll see you in a couple hours then. Yeah. Yeah. Wee, have fun. All right. Thanks, Jenny. So. All right. Bye. Hi, Ellie. Bye, Ellie. Flash bye, the Roger. Bye, Roger. How did your music start? At the beginning. At the very beginning? Like, that. that's the Patreon intro. 
This is here. Breaking yeah. news. Oh, so that's all of it. Okay. Yeah. I just make sure you have to turn it. Nope. Um, and just the, the blank space. And then tail, tail end, you got that too. Yep. All right. Why does it keep popping? Yes. There you go. More. And now you want to send it out as a MP3. MP3, right? could you put it in the Tom Tech book? Totally. So we'll put it there. We'll go. It's on. You have a, a group. Uh, oh, there it is. Same file name, right? Just MP3. Uh, yeah. 2016. Yeah, that's fine. That. Nice. There it goes. Yep. Pulls it out. All right. And so in moments, this will show up here. I should try to do it. Should be pretty quick. We've got the bandwidth. I should never do that. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> I'll vote for PS4. Never. All right. I'm going to finish publishing. Uh, so, when we're going to get out of here to uh, get ready for the analyst call. Uh, so, keep an eye on patreon.com slash DTNS if you're an analyst for the link there. And, of course, if you're not, it will be available on demand later. Or you might get an analyst to be nice and send you the link. We might, we might put it out for everybody. Uh, we'll talk to you in a little bit. Bye.